This is the last of four calls about governance. Uh, this one is on Thursday, March 14th, 2024. We've been talking through um, things like what's working for governance around the world, uh, but we're kind of kicking around a variety of ideas here. And um, uh, we will see who shows up again. Uh, Eleanor um, had sent me an email earlier this morning, which I have not read yet, but was just describing her the questions she put in the email. And they're great questions. And Gil, one of them is the, uh, the question you raised, I think, at the end of uh, our last call uh, of this string. Uh, and I will paraphrase it, but like, how do we prevent uh, Trump from winning the next election and us slipping into the future that he and the Heritage Foundation and others are painting for us? Um, uh, which I think is a an interesting uh, thing to go after. I, you go ahead, Gil. Yeah, painting in in exquisite detail. And so, and Eleanor, I'm uh, I'm kind of stealing your thunder here, but if if you wouldn't uh, if you would wouldn't mind elaborating on that, but also then asking your second question, we can sort of put those on the table right now. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. As so, the first question I think Gil has raised this, but. It's really urgent about we're living in a country where there's an election just months away where one of the lead candidates is saying that he would essentially work as a, a fascist and be a dictator. And we've got it all laid out in, in great detail, Project 2025 and his own speeches, what he's going to do. So is there anything that this group on governance could do to expose that, prevent that from happening in November. So that's kind of my first urgent and pressing question. And the second question is, it's entirely possible that the hostilities within the United States and the divisions here could lead to a civil war. We are already, in my view, in a cold civil war it could turn into a hot civil war as soon as the election in November, no matter which candidate is said to be the winner. So uh, is there uh, anything that this group could do with all its brilliance and expertise on governance that could help think about if we do collapse into a civil war, what would be then a structure of governance, a system of governance that we could propose that could help guide the country out of that meltdown and into a new and better era. Those are my two questions. Um, thanks, Eleanor. And sobering, sobering they are. Propose, uh, Gil asks, propose to whom in the chat? I think, Eleanor, if we were in a civil war, I think you mean propose to other citizens willing to listen? Exactly. I, I think it's entirely possible we'll hit a point where there's armed rebellion and fighting in the streets. And it could be a protracted struggle that goes on for a while. But as, as Gil is very uh, fond and, and says rightly, conversation can turn into creating a new world. Could this group have a conversation that could come up with recommendations or outline or guidelines for a system of governance that would be better than what we have now, because what we have now has led us into this predicament. And if this group could come up with it, I think we could seed it in a number of places and, and have it taken up at the uh, when needed. And, and Eleanor, I think your second question gets at the itch that caused me to set up this sequence of four calls, which is, hey, What's what's broken is broken because there are like all sorts of problems throughout the system, and we have interesting critiques of of what's broken. But I'd love to know what works so that we could start to use that as a raft that will float and that eventually becomes a floating city or something like that. Like what like what would you start from? Um, and I, and I, I mentioned I think on one of the calls that. Um, kind of tongue in cheek a couple years, some multiple years ago, I bought the domain foobarism.com as a placeholder religion. And, and the exercise was meant to be, hey, if you were going to invent a religion of your own, what would you put in it? What, what would you want to have in a, in a religion? 
Um, and so this is the same question, but about how might we co-regulate? And, and we've had some debates on these calls about, well, governance isn't the right word. It's about co-regulation. It's about cooperation or collaboration. And it's like, okay, those are, those are interesting questions. I still think that, that governance is kind of in, in the middle of it. And then a third thing I'll say about it, and then I'll, I'll see what, I'll, what everybody else uh, would like to offer on this. Uh, a third angle on this is that I still think that governance and trust are kind of behind a lot of these things because one of the reasons we're having these conflicts is that a lot of people feel like whatever broken government system we have has not included them. They're left behind, they are excluded, they are looked down on, uh, whatever else might be happening, we are not co-regulating well as from their perspective. So uh, they've been approached by people with a different program and they're like, well, okay, we'll try that program. Um, and that's not going well. Well, this is kind of cool. I'm seeing several versions of Mike uh, in the in the gallery. I think he's switching devices, but it's kind of, I, I feel like a little panopticon effect is happening with, with Mike. Oh, perfect. Even better. Thank you. Love that. Um, so let me, let me go quiet for a second and see if this uh, stirs anything for anybody else on the call. Uh, please, Stacey. So Eleanor, um, I had brought up an idea in this in other groups, in different groups related, using to, to go to what Judy was saying earlier. I came in the end, but I thought I heard her talking about how people are learning not so much from books and to what Jerry's talking about with trust and relationship. I had thought about the idea of taking the 2025 platform, but just taking the backbone out of it and starting a series of calls that other people could take with their groups as well um, to sort of rewrite, like, what would you, what would you want? And to just, but do it like, like a syllabus, like taking one step at a time where we get to actually discuss it. Um, in our groups, it would be discussing the differences within our sameness, because even though most of us agree mostly about certain things, there are nuances there, but having those conversations would then lead out to other conversations in a more organized way. At least that's the way I see it. So I just wanted to throw that yeah, out. I love that idea. And you know, the Heritage Foundation, since the late 1970s, they put together a whole blueprint for the country when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980 and 84. And they had it all thought through of what needed to be done. And I've often thought we need to have that similar level of seriousness and depth and clarity on what do we do around governance. Uh, and so we're not just playing on reactive all the time. So sign me up for that conversation. I would love to be part of that. If, if I could just want, add one more point. The reason that I chose the 2025 thing is they've already identified where their energy is, where their values are. It's there for, we don't have to argue about it. We see no. where it is. Now we can just shift it and kind of do our thing. <laughs> so, so just Stacey, just for clarity for me, um, when you say uh, the 2025, do you mean we should pick apart the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 platform and analyze it, or do you mean we should no. build we should build a, a reply to that, a, a, some other version of that? There is a document that I think I shared with you, the Mandate for Leadership, I think it's called. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's part of the Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership or yeah. Conservative Promise. Yes. So the very first basic conversation, the one I had with a friend of mine who's on the other side just started with that they want to support the family. And we just simply talked about where that could go wrong or maybe it should be shifted to, sh to the community. But we went back and forth with that because, be, I mean, I think everybody agrees that the family is broken down. But where we might disagree is, so should we try to squash it back together or should we be taking care of the people that don't have families or... What can we do? But again, it comes from conversations with, you don't have to have a PhD to have this, to have these opinions. I don't. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, an interesting thing is that um, 
the the Republicans in this election cycle don't have a platform. They didn't create a platform. The thing you're pointing to was created by Heritage Foundation, is outside the Republican Party, but they they basically swallowed this program, I think, wholesale. They seem to be all on board, but there's no official Republican Party platform. There is a Democratic Party platform. And a, a new, much more conservative than me friend pointed out that if you go read the Democratic Party platform, there's a whole lot of stuff in there about equity and equality and social justice. It, it reads like a social justice manifesto. There's almost nothing in there about running a country and making a country better. And he pointed that out and I was like, ah, crap, that really sucks. <laughs> Um, so that was very interesting to go read the Democratic Party platform because it felt like it had been overtaken by, eaten by people who cared only about those issues. And that seems to be a huge problem. That's causing a lot of friction, I think, in 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 this in this space. Uh, so we've got uh, <laughs> two two mics and a gill <laughs> in my queue. <laughs> so Mike, you're gonna have to speak twice. Or twice as fast. Yes. Or just drop um, a mic. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, real quick, um, I love this idea about chewing on how do we counter Project 2025, because it's very specific and it allows us to go through and, and actually see where the weak points are in it. And most importantly, see where the inconsistencies are. I've done a lot of pieces recently on uh, myth busting. <clears throat> so taking on people's purported positions and pointing out why it's built on a, a, a phony or false foundation. And often it's really simple to knock out the foundation. One way you can do it is by coming up with a better way of describing what it is that they're trying to do. Um, the thing I would alter though, is I would not focus so much on what we need to do and who needs to do it, I mean, that's a very hard, involved process, and it and you'd, you'd need to get hundreds of people around your idea to, to really be credible. Instead, this group is incredibly creative, coming from lots of different perspectives, and we know so much about what other people have thought in the past. If we can just change the framing, and, and this often is two tweets, and 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 focus. Do what do what um, um, Frank Luntz did. I, I did. How many people remember Frank Luntz from the nineties? Oh, can't forget him. Yeah, he was Newt Gingrich's mind control expert, and he did this so effectively. They they had their own contract with America. It was uh, Newt Gingrich's platform that got the Republicans elected in, 12, in 1994 so that they could take over control of the House. And they simply went through and came up with things like changing the estate tax to the death tax. And somehow we have to change it back to the trust fund, the uh, the trust fund baby subsidy. <laughs> you know, what I mean, somehow you have to just get people to think differently and to realize that they're they're coming at things from the wrong perspective. I mean, we were we were talking on an earlier call about these data protectionism efforts and how you know it's it makes so much sense to keep TikTok out of America until you realize that you've just given permission to 80 dictators around the world to keep YouTube out of Tunisia and Kazakhstan and everywhere else. And so if, if you can just the it to, uh, sometimes it's literally two tweets, but mm -hmm. I, I would change the focus though from uh, the what what Trump wants to do to the government, and instead look at those pieces of it where they want to fundamentally change the Congress, mm -hmm. and that's that's there's different pieces of the project. It's it's a huge project, and I, I don't think we're going to have a lot to say about what they want to do to the judiciary. And I don't know that we would, people would listen to us on, on those issues, but if we could somehow point out where they're going to do things that make the Congress even more dysfunctional and allow Trump to be more autocratic, I, I think that's, that's where our leverage is is because it just takes five members of the house to change from Democrat to Republican. And 
And, and, and even if Trump wins, we, we now have a firewall against autocracy. Just a couple thoughts, but I, I love where we're going with this because it is specific and it is something that we could spread like wildfire to people who could pick it up and push it out to their activist communities. Thanks, Mike. I want to pour a tiny bit of kerosene on what you just said. Um, <laughs> the role model here is Viktor Orban, who just visited Trump at Mar-a-Lago and who over the last decade has turned uh, Hungary into an illiberal democracy, which he says. He's like, we are now an illiberal democracy, which means illiberal democracies look like democracies. People still vote. There is a judiciary. There is a press. There is whatever. But all of those are owned uh, and basically taken care of. Uh, so they're, they're, it's an autocracy that masquerades as democracy. So it's illiberal democracy. And I think the plan is not just to weaken Congress, but to you know completely own and permanently but burn into the system uh, irreversibly as much as possible, as much as as much as our system can be sort of set in concrete for a long a long period of time, but there are mechanisms to change things. But I will point out there hasn't been an amendment to the constitution in a long time. And there's a whole separate conversation about, hey, why is our constitution so old and tired? Why don't we actually like upgrade it a little bit? Um, and, and there is something we could do very, very practical. If we put together like the 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 10 things to save to save the Congress or make Congress great again. We could have our list of eight or 10 things and then start sending average citizens to the town halls that all these uh, incumbents are holding and stand up and say, do you agree that we need to blank in 2025 when the next Congress convenes? So are you saying we need to hire Frank Luntz to run the counter campaign to his previous campaign? I'm ready to. And he he's actually pretty I mean, the, the people who are most frustrated in Washington are people like Frank Luntz, who think government's important and have a, a, a Republican label. I mean, these yep. the Repu my Republican friends are going absolutely stark raving mad, and they're looking for where where they're going to move to, what party could be formed. The progressive equivalent of Frank Luntz is George Lakoff, who has not been yeah. nearly as effective. Nor not nearly as effective. Well, he's too so academic. I mean, Nor Gore used him a lot in the 90s. We used to have dinner parties with him. He was a neighbor of mine in Berkeley. Yeah. Um, Jose, then Gil. Um, I really like the idea of, of doing something, actually doing something. So that's that's nice to hear. I haven't been party to these conversations. My schedule hasn't permitted. Um, the The... The idea of uh, working with something like Project 2025, uh, I really like. I, I liked from the beginning when Stacy mentioned. Um, I do struggle, though, with the idea of uh, us and them. Um, the idea that this is a uh, us rebutting their their ideologies and vice versa. As you pointed out, Jerry, I think we're we're dealing with extremes on both sides and both extreme sides only see the other extreme side and the big gulf in the middle is ignored because it just doesn't have the same level of uh distaste as as the extremes do um so the first thing i see when i open up project 2025 is about the grip of the radical left and what you've just described um as the the platform um the democratic platform sounds to me like the grip of the radical left um what can i explore that with you for a sec please um because the radical left wants people to be called by the proper pronouns wants to make restrooms available for transgender kids wants transgender care there's a, a bunch of other things the radical right wants to take away women's reproductive freedom which will cause lots of death so, so I don't. I think there's a false equivalence, and there's a, there's a radical right and there's a radical left, and they're kind of equal. Doesn't ever really work for me, but I'm falling into the left-right binary conversation by doing so. Yes, and, but I think the 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 fact that we've got these extreme positions as what is dividing us, we're missing out in the. 99% that's in the middle. The average person doesn't, in their daily lives, sorry for my language here, but they don't give a shit about any of this stuff, right? 
this stuff is just fodder for the fight. It's mm -hmm. not what it's not going to pay my mortgage. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to get my, my kids uh, a job. It's not going to get them having a life better than what they have. Blah, 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 blah. Right. That's what's making me feel shitty wherever I sit in the political spectrum. And if, if I think we take the fight to these extreme issues, then we're, we're really fighting stuff that isn't really the problem. It's only been political fodder so that there could be a fight, mm -hmm. right? This, this whole abortion thing was a political game. It wasn't. <laughs> I love that you guys both have the hat. Um, this, this fight isn't, it's a game. And we're falling into it's a lethal playing game. the game. It's a lethal game that's actually like running the table right now. But but, right. but we can't buy into it because if we do, <laughs> um, make which one make Earth, make Earth cool again says Gil. <laughs> I love it. Um, I just want to be clear about this because I'm uh, being kind of mishy washy here. But my my point is, let's not fall into the game of fighting over the things that some activists have decided are the things we should be arguing about. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the things that are real. Thank you very much. Um, Gil. Yep. Um, since we're doing hats, Tom, you got to catch up on your hat. Uh, this is from the Global Climate Summit in San Francisco, I think in 2017 at Moscone Center. I almost got jumped walking to the park from there because it was a red hat, you know, so there's that. Um, golly, so many things here. Um, we're talking to two levels in this conversation. One is about how to head off a possible MAGA sweep in November which is the immediate, the immediate emergency first aid question. And then we're talking about how do we change the conversation and the trajectory of democracy and governance and politics in this country. And they're different and they're related, obviously, but just to flag that. Um, um, Frank Luntz has been generous in giving advice to Democrats. Democrats don't always take it, <laughs> as they didn't take George Lakoff's advice very well. So there's that. Um, and you know, the mystery of why that is, I think, is important. Uh, 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 Doug, what you're saying about the... Uh, so, yeah, Mike, I'm not interested in refuting the heritage platform. That's a different kind of game. Somebody's got to do that. That's not this conversation. Um, the Democrat platform is indicative of the problem because it's, um, um, uh, you know, well, to put it very simply, identity politics is not the concern of most people in this country. But when we think about that, uh, when we think about moving from policy doc, doc, documents to something that's evocative, that captures people's imagination, that captures people, people's hearts. Um, look, look, you know, we're 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 dealing. We have super majorities in this country around most progressive issues. Uh, it depends how you frame them. It depends on how you ask the questions, but about right to choose, about gun control, and a whole host of other things. The majorities run in the 70s, 80s, and 90%. That's been true for decades. The People's Bicentennial Commission in, what was 19, in, in God, long time ago, 1976 did polling on this and showed that then. And most of the polls I've seen since then have been consistent on that. Um, um, so uh, communication that that captures people ima people's imaginations about the things they really care about and the world they want, the world we want, uh, is really a different approach than critique of what is or attacks on the other guys. Um, um, one of the first things I did when I was CSO of Palo Alto was write a future story of like, you know, looking back from 2030 at what our community, what the world was like then. And it was designed to be evocative and had people say, yeah, I, I want that. That's what I want. How do we get there? Uh, it's a very different kind of game than what politics usually plays. So, uh, Mike, I like what you're saying about changing the framing. Um, it, you know, it, it, yeah, it's only two tweets if it's the right two tweets. 
and it takes the kind of messaging brilliance of people like Lakoff and Luntz and advertising folks and so forth, but it takes a fundamental sense of what is it that we're trying to do here? And I think what we're trying to do is, uh, and, and I found this in, you know, in, in small scale and personal conversations and the work of Search for Common Ground and the work of Living Room Dialogues and others that, um, that and the brilliant work of Bill Reed in conflict communities uh, is that um, there are ways to bring people together and find that they really care and care deeply about the same things. And when the conversation can go to there, very different things happen than if the conversation is about what we disagree about. Uh, and I'm claiming that there is enough of a core of common concern in this country, even in the face of the, of the shredding of the social fabric that we're seeing, where that conversation is possible. Um, and the question is, how do we, what are, you know, this is, this is what we got. We got 11 people here and one bot. Um, you know, how, how do we drop some seeds into the pond or some seeds into the super saturated solution to have a couple of tweets go, you know, how do we, how do we go viral with some core messaging that captures imagination and shifts the conversation? Cause you know, like we don't have multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar ad budgets. We've got a bunch of people who are smart and interested and have networks of networks of networks. So I'm I'm in that question here, which is not where I expected to be at the beginning of this call. I'm complete. Thank you, Stacy. Well, I agree with the last part of what Gil said, but I disagree with the first part, which is that these are two different conversations. Hmm. Because part of the reason, if Maga, if he were to win, part hmm. of the reason would be because of all the everybody has an opinion. Everybody wants to give that opinion. We see that on Facebook. People aren't spending hours and hours on Facebook because they don't want to share their opinion. The people that will support Matt, will support Trump, if that were to happen, which I really hope it won't happen, will be doing it because they are so angry and frustrated and tired of trusting the establishment. So the way I look at it, if we don't bring these people into conversations and help them to create something alongside of us, we're missing it. And to clarify about the original project, it's not about disputing what's in 2025. It's about taking the pieces that we actually agree with and just you know, making them readable and putting it out as the people's platform by whatever name you want to call it. I don't care. Thank you. Um, and so there, I've got too many things going on in my head. Uh, so there's a, so you were saying earlier, Stacey, that, uh, you know, the family, the family unit is broken or something like that is a thing we might be able to agree on and reframe. Uh, for I wouldn't even point. have, I'm sorry, I wouldn't even have that, con this is too high level of a conversation for that. I would take a conversation with that, maybe in a Facebook group that I was starting just to get to know people. So there's different levels and di there's just, we can have another planning call because I looked it over and I have already thought about where I think we would start that would fit in with other people's interests that don't even have to do with politics, but that are also in our networks. Thanks. Um, um, Tom said something really interesting in the chat about how the abortion positions were opposite back in the 50s and 60s. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of interesting history around, um, I guess, uh, the abortion issue, uh, in particular also uh, in the, when, when Roe v. Wade passed in 73, the Southern Baptist Convention was like, yep, this is good. And they were on board with, uh, with uh, that as policy. Uh, it is, I think, my, my take on what's been happening is it is political strategists who've decided to blow oxygen on the abortion issue and make it a key massive issue, uh, which it is now. It's a, a, absolutely a massive issue, except the far right has won so much on it that they're now afraid that there's going to be huge blowback. And when Biden said in the State of the Union, and while looking at the Supreme Court, you are about to now witness the power of women, 
um, uh, and I hope he's right from his lips to God's ears is what I was thinking, uh, that, that that may be playing out. Tom, do you want to say more about just that in, in general? Um, I'm, I don't know that in general. I feel like there's, I, I was part of a conversation that had at Fetzer Institute in the early 2000s, which is where my comment came from, uh, that had very high level uh, right wing people in it, including that that guy's name I, slips my mind, but he's very famous uh, for crafting the legislation, or crafting the strategy that makes all the people sign up against all the um, Congress people sign up against any additional taxes, uh, and who wants to strangle government in the crib? That that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he was he was Norm, present. Norm Norm Norm. Yeah, Norbert. It's in the Norm, chat. Uh, it's in the chat. Grover Norquist. Grover Norquist. There we go. Grover he, was, he, was, he was in this conversation, and so was the head of the uh, of the <laughs> national the American Conservative Union, and there are a bunch of left-wing people, but not nearly as high placed. This was during Clinton's administration. It was actually on the week of Reagan's funeral. Uh, and the uh, National Conservative, American Conservative Union head said he was there. He was attending this instead of Reagan's funeral because George W. Bush was gonna claim the, the uh, what do you call it, not the cloak, the, the mantle of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, and he says George W. Bush is no Ronald Reagan. You know, for him, Ronald Reagan is like is like a Lincoln or something. Uh, but I taught had lots of conversation with him, and I was really amazed at how much agreement there was between us. And I got the feeling how my progressive perspective, and I researched these people before I went to the conversation with them. It was just like, fuck, I don't. This is a lion's den. I don't want to go in there. And then finding out that they're real human beings with nuanced perspectives, nothing like their public personas was revelatory for me. And I realized that my, my habitual from childhood raising and progressive perspective had me divided and conquered from other people I could work with. Mm -hmm. um, that I was actually the effect of that binary mm -hmm. framing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also remember the public what was called the Public Conversations Project uh, and that's a different name now, but in Boston, their their big thing was on abortion. They took a half dozen abortion um, or uh, pro-life activists and pro-choice activists from each side and brought them together for confidential conversations, during which it became clear that there was an entire spectrum of opinion in, in them. And it was the political majoritarian battle, you know, the, the, that divided battle that made the position so solid. Because you have to ally yourself with your, you have to go vote for the guy who's better than the other guy. Because if you don't, the other guy's going to win. There's no, the, the, the idea of the, uh, what is it called? The, um, the choice, um, choice voting, instant runoff voting. And stuff ranked like choice. That. Right, ranked choice. But there's a bunch of other ones also. There's, yeah. there's ones that are ranking, there's ones that are rating, uh, star voting, whatever. Those things are trying to break down the binary. Uh, and have more representative spectrum of opinions for people to choose from. Um, so I'm <clears throat> junk all privacy. <laughs> interesting phrase. Uh, the forward party uh, is pushing prim um, open primaries and ranked choice voting as a way to break through. Because when you have these separate primaries, the most act the people who come for the separate primaries are the most activist people in the different sides and they vote in their their candidate is going to be the most extreme or has to speak to that extreme then you get to the general election what you've got is a bunch of extremes uh so having open primaries and random choice actually a very not random choice so ranked choice uh, is actually a very interesting strategy from a practical political system change perspective. And they've been getting that on ballot in state after state. I don't necessarily agree uh, with the other perspectives of the people who do, are doing it, but it's an actual systems change thing. Uh, yeah, so I, the whole left-right thing, I like braver angels because they can prove, they prove that left-right people can talk together. Uh, that's like established, and they have thousands of people from who identify as red or blue, who have been part of them, and that a lot of those people now go. Since we can talk together, what's next? You know, 
what what's supposed to happen now that we can humanize each other and talk together so the idea of using talking to them about actions that people can take once their left and right thing has been eased up and they can see each other as human beings that potentially work together that that's a raw material kind of space for uh, working with people on that kind of thing and then my thing has for a long time has been random selection you know random selected citizen councils and stuff because that breaks away from the whole right left thing you're getting a broad spectrum of perspectives but that's another subject check thanks tom uh, before passing the mic to dave i just wanted to explain a couple things i put in the chat um in in adam grant talks about complexification as a way of uh, finding agreement with people which means hey this isn't just a big binary thing it's a complex issue and let's peel it apart and then we'll see what's inside the issue and we'll discover that we agree with each other more than we think we do uh the bannon's assertions note in my brain i listened to an interview of steve bannon who is not on my pantheon of heroes uh and uh, i basically in good faith took notes on the conversation and and wrote down the statements he was making during the interview. And I will say that 60% of the things he said, I agree with. Like the, the party of Davos uh, said, let's globalize and let the devil take the hindmost. Yep, check, totally agree with that. And then there's a bunch of stuff that, I, that, that he said that I disagree with. And that it's very interesting to sort of disaggregate that and see how it is, in part also because it lets you see how people are building their arguments and what they're doing. So that's uh, that's kind of one, uh, one piece. Um, then... Newt Gingrich, when he came in, um, instituted a bunch of things that are still a problem. He, he before Gingrich, um, Congress critters used to share crash pads. They used to share rented flats in D.C. Uh, and and uh, different parties would share the same apartment. So they had to live together. They ate together at the table. They shared the gym. They shared dining. You know, they basically ate in, in the, in the Congress congressional mess. They had lots of times they played softball against each other and with each other. They had lots of places where they could sit and talk and cut deals. Uh, Gingrich basically said, if you so much as talk to somebody on the other side, we're going to cut away your primary, your, your funding in the primary. And because the house is so gerrymandered, nobody in the house is afraid of the, of the general. They're afraid of the primary. The, the contest is really in the primaries. And that really, really, really changed the tenor of Congress enormously, and I think it's well. It, it wasn't that threat, Jerry. The the as so much as the fact that Gingrich said, "Okay, we're only going to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so you can all go home to your district and you know build support." When they were there Monday through Friday, like most working people, they moved their families to Washington. So it really uh, that that and their it, family it, their families socialized together. Yep, correct. Their wives were friends. Yep. When this broke. They no longer had the constraint of their wives being friends and saying, hey, hey you know, Joe, don't do that. Uh, it was, I mean, it was a brilliant move on Gingrich's part and hugely destructive. Uh, so that was just uh, interesting background and so forth. Um, Dave, off to you. Yeah, thanks. It was a great conversation. I was thinking the... Uh... I got everything I learned I got from West Wing, you know, and I, I watch it every 10 years just to, and, and it's interesting because I feel like I learned different things, you know, um, and I, I just watched it a month or two ago. And uh, the it's interesting to watch. I mean, I think bottom line, right, if you're going to assume that, quote, democracy works, you're also making an assumption that, you know, at least half the people are well intentioned and competent. Right. And. You know, it's an assumption that we're still testing, I think, right? It's possible, arguably, that like our notions of democracy don't really work because we don't have that many well-intentioned, competent people, you know, who are willing to participate. Maybe that's it. They, and they have to participate. Um, and, you know, we're, I feel like we're testing that theory right now in the United States. It's like, really? We're like, you know, right at the edge, 50-50. <laughs> uh, and, and, and if you want, like, what, from watching West Wing, which was, I think, a liberal democratic kind of presentation, there's a ton of disrespect for the policy, right? I mean, like there, there's no, you know, Josh Lyman does not like the voter. And and most of the effort is kind of how do we kind of trick people, you know, into doing what we want to have done, right? What's the game we can play? And I think that's the technocratic role. And I expect most of us fall into this technocratic framing, right? Where we're trying to get what we want done, you know, kind of 
you know, through the process. We're going to understand the process enough to get, you know, like, and Newt Gingrich is in that same space and he's quite good at it, right? And I've, I've tried to go back and examine my technocratic impulses and imagine what it would be like to not have them, kind of. What does it look like to, cry, to kind of be genuinely participatory or something like that? And I still trip up a lot, but I do feel like there is something to, you know, and then and it's combined with somehow we've reinforced the party um, split, or you know, which it seems to play out in a whole bunch of societies. This is a note going by that the Republicans are getting rid of the green pins that identified congressmen because they, they didn't like green, you know. Um, because but they're happy to wear AK. Uh, they're happy. <laughs> they're happy to wear, wear AR-15 pins. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know what. I'm not going to even comment on what pins they are wearing. But yeah, but yeah. it's amazing what you know how we've done this split, and it, it made me think of uh, the um, old Kurt Vonnegut stuff of Grand Falloons versus the Karas, and and you know kind of like political parties as a Grand Falloon, but a very powerful one, you know, and loyalty to the party above all else. And so I don't know what it looks like to have switched from pro-abortion to anti-abortion was that like a, a a paradigm shift kind of movement in the uh, who did the paradigm book um kind of like all the old republicans died off and new republicans took over with the abortion stuff or did people actually just the the policy switched and everybody just rode along with it which one was it and it, it feels like right now we're seeing a whole bunch of stuff where the policy just switches and people are saying fine i'll go with it you know it's like trump is the worst thing that'll ever happen Oh, Trump's our guy. Let's go with it. You know, and it's uh, it's an amazing switch amongst the same people. It's not like we've had a, a generation die off and the next generation take over. Um, so anyway, I, I don't I don't know how to fix anything, but those are the two things I've been thinking about. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, two thoughts. Um, there's the reason I called these four calls governance and not democracy was that I've got a thought in my brain was 2006 peak democracy, which is about the, the the sort of continuous tugs to the far right and illiberal democracy and all those kinds of things. But also because the whole one person, one vote thing, I'm unclear that that's the best way to actually govern ourselves. And uh, by democracy, I would mean uh, individual autonomy, though. Not one person, one vote is kind of unimplementation of a democratic format. But but it's really it's like individual autonomy versus aggregated autocracy. I think is the, the the spectrum. I would I would use democracy towards the people get to decide for themselves and the, on the end of the spectrum. I, I'm curious how all of us would define democracy or whether we would agree on a definition of democracy because I'm unclear that we would. And I, I wasn't thinking of autonomy as a part of my definition of democracy. It's not a word I would have used had you asked me to sit down and write a definition of democracy. That word would not have shown up in it. But I like what you said. Um, and then the second thing I want to say, and this goes back to how do we stop the Trump apocalypse from happening, is that um, it appears that the law doesn't work. Um, I, I am in, like from the, I have a T-shirt that's in the next room over uh, that says it's Mueller time. Uh, in the same script as Miller time from back in the day, which is like way too early for young people these days. They have no reference for it. But when the Mueller report was about to come out, I was like, okay, great. They sort of, we finally like cornered the fella. And that didn't work just because Barr went out and said, oh, he's, you know, th this doesn't hold him guilty. I'm like, wait, how did that? I was as surprised about that melting away as I was about the Dean scream kicking uh, uh, Dean off the campaign back in the day. It's like, wait, he was hoarsely screaming at his followers to exhort them. And two, and a week later, he's not in the camp. Oh, how did that break? And I think there's, there's just a lot of sausage being made behind the curtain that I'm just unaware of. Um, so that, that's probably happening there. But, <clears throat> but I, I have a thought in my brain called T91, which is Trump's 91 and uh, various counts, various indictments. And, um, and they're melting away. Uh, and T91 doesn't include the cases in front of the Supreme Court, which are about his immunity, which are, you know, other kind. there's a there's another thought in my brain right next to that about what a Supreme Court watch, SCOTUS watch, uh, because there's really important things there. Any one of any one of which, any one of which could be disqualifying. And Trump is now have has to pony up $450 million uh, for a lawsuit. And that's not going to stop. How how is he is he working in bullet time where he can dodge everything? Is he a weeble or a clown, a punching clown where he just bobs bobs back up to the surface after everything? I do not understand how earnest attempts to use the system to stop this madness have not worked and might not work. 
And people who say, oh, just let the voters decide, um, like, don't don't try to block him with all these legal methods. Just let the voters. That's bullshit, because if he if he loses and it's close, you know what's going to happen right after that. So I'm frustrated by all that. Jose. I share your frustration, but I suspect that he has much more experience than anyone else in using the courts and his benefit. Oh, to his he benefit. was he was trained um, by Roy Cohn. So Roy Cohn was one of his mentors, and Roy Cohn was uh, McCarthy's lawyer during the Army McCarthy hearings and all that in the McCarthy era. Go ahead, Gil. Um, we're seeing here a really fascinating and scary example of what John Robb calls asymmetrical warfare. Um, you got Trump and Roy Cohn, who are masters at gaming the system and have got uh, you know a skewed judiciary um, because of some you know good fortune on appointments. Uh, and the, the broader we um, are playing by the rules um, in, a, in a system that is slow by design and hard to correct quickly. And, you know, um, people have wondered whether whether the, not, whether the circuit will intervene and take Aline Cannon out of the mix, but that hasn't happened. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the core of the game is delay. Trump doesn't have to win in court. He just has to delay court decisions until after November. Right. Uh, and um, and uh, so it's a so, so that we're playing different games. We're playing with different tools and different rules. And it's asymmetric. And, you know, to the point about asymmetric warfare is that <laughs> it's very hard for conventional armies to fight guerrillas. Just ask, his, ask the IDF right now. Just ask the IDF right now and everything else. So, you know, I mean, you know, we, we've all lived with many examples of these, but it's just it's very hard to do. It's, it, you know, I mean, Putin, who doesn't face the same constraints as the IDF, took a very different approach in Chechnya. There, it's like a no restraint approach. That's one way to deal with insurgents, but that doesn't work in the long run either. I uh, I just wanted to. So my comment was wasn't the comment that I had. I like the idea of uh, defining democracy uh, and of uh, understanding what components each of us think a democracy uh, contains, because I suspect it's a lot more varied than most of us would um, assume. And, uh, and I, I noticed that Tom during that topic had raised his hand. So I just wanted to give him a, a word. Oh, I took my video off just to let you know, cause I'm getting an internet connection problem. Uh, but I was raising my hand to define democracy, which I put in the chat as ruled by ordinary people slash those who are being ruled. It's in that space that democracy, like if those who, idea of democracy of those who are impacted by decisions should have a voice in making it that's different from a we the people kind of democracy and what i realized recently is there's two at least two branches uh of what democracy is one of which is stakeholders which is those who are impacted by a particular things going on in a particular decision domain or issue domain uh and then there's the we the people and the we the people one is centered on place you are a citizen of a place you're a citizen of a state or a you know county or a, uh, or a country or whatever, and that's where your voice is expressed. And the stakeholder voice is for an issue. People gather around an issue, often widely around, um, divided among many different levels of of governance. Uh, and there is emerging. This is like five years ago. Ran into this around the world in many different circumstances. There are. Uh, emerging collaborations between stakeholder networks across uh, sector lines, multi-sector, multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-scale networks collaborating, sometimes dysfunctionally, sometimes functional, but it's a totally different approach to governance. And these are people who are involved on the ground in a particular issue domain, you know, like agriculture, you know, food systems. That's the one I became familiar with at first. And all the different players are getting into collaborative conversations and then they go and just do something. They do what they came up with. There's nobody to appeal to. All of the citizen councils, fancy citizen councils we have now are, uh, 
are sophisticated versions of petitioning the government or petitioning the king. You know, king, here's what we think should be done. Please do it. And that's what these councils do at a more sophisticated level. Um, so having, if you can somehow weave together the citizens and the uh, and the stakeholder kinds of governance, and with the fellow who wrote to the list right before and I answered, uh, who brought that model up as sort of like experts, people who are, you're trying to get deeper understanding of what's going on and doing that collectively across all, all fields of expertise. That's a whole nother way to define it if you, step away from governance and think of collective intelligence and collective wisdom. We're not talking about, I said, wise democracy is my thing because I want to have not just everybody have an equal voice, but actually generating wisdom for the whole mm -hmm. uh, is a shift in perspective. Um, but I think democracy in terms of self-governance, all the different human, human rights is a form of self-governance. You're able to govern yourself, not have interference in that. Etc. I think democracy is rel relatively easy to define at a generic level, you know, and a root, you know, demos is ordinary people and democracy is, is government. So anyway, those are all the thoughts that are bubbling in my head when I put my hand up. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for that. And you reminded me of something I wound up reading uh, recently from a different thread, which is the Sarvodia movement <clears throat> um, in Sri Lanka and how it's about self-governance and self-empowerment. And I'll, I'll leave it to anyone who wants to, to read the page or, or whatever. But uh, Sarvodia is one of the examples of when I said, what seems to work in governance? I think this, I think this would make the, the short list of, of systems that seem to work well, um, at, like the ones you were just describing, Tom. Um, go ahead, Tom. Uh, go ahead, Ken. And you're muted. There. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Sarvodia means we wake up together, is how it translates. Um, <laughs> so I posted something to the OGM list uh, this week. Harvard Radcliffe Institute had a really interesting article about um, uh, civil rights and uh, the law and the Supreme Court and, you know, the the Constitution is colorblind, and the and the woman speaking is like the Constitution is absolutely not colorblind, absolutely not colorblind. It said black people are three fifths of of a human being. That is not colorblind at all. But the really interesting thing that that caught my eye in this post that's pretty long. I don't think many people read it, if anybody. But they said if you want to figure out what originalism means, look at the problems that the framers are trying to solve. Don't try to figure out their intent. What was the problem they were trying to solve? Right. And I think that's missing from a lot of our, our public level conversations about governance is people are just talking about it should be this way or that way, rather than what is the actual problem we're trying to solve. Right now we have a problem, which has turned into a wicked mess, that our system of governance has been gamed by special interests and it no longer works for the people. We the people it doesn't work for it. Right. So how do we get back to solving that? That, you know, the solving the problem of how do we create a system of governments that works for the people that is, as Eleanor put in here, and I believe it's written in the Constitution, you know, that the consent of the governed is given. I do not give my consent to a lot of what's going on in governance these days. Um, and I think a lot of people, that's why we have such a, a polarized mess right now, is a lot of people are saying that, you know, it's not working. Yes, did it work for the people? It depends on how you define the people. It worked great for white landowners when it first started. It has not worked too well for women or black people or you know gay people. So that's that's at the next level. How do we design a system of governance that works for everybody, where everyone feels I'm willing to give my consent because I feel that my needs and my concerns and my interests are being looked after and taken care of, and I can see that in my day-to-day -day life. That's what I would like to work on. Um, I just want to tease, uh, Gil, hold on a second. I know you want to jump in. Um, yeah. Yeah, hang on just for a sec. Um, I just want to tease something out uh, from what you said. Look look at the problems they were trying to solve. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the book, The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry, which makes the very, very interesting assertion that the American Revolutionary War was actually a civil war so that the U.S. could preserve slavery and break away from England, which was which was abolishing slavery way before we did. 
And the American Civil War was actually a revolutionary war where we broke the legal back of slavery. But that slavery was one of the things, one of the problems they were trying to solve for to preserve it. Sure. So, so that that imputes much more. And, and by the way, uh, eight of the first ten presidents were slaveholders from Virginia. Uh, the Adamses are the only ones who are abolitionists. The two Adamses. Um, there's a, just a whole mess of whoa, Nelly. The North was profiting wildly from slavery. Um, insurance companies in, in uh, Connecticut were underwriting uh, slaves. Uh, New York City was banking it, the whole thing. So uh, I'm just trying to like pry mm -hmm. apart how do we understand what people were thinking about and, and doing back then. Um, uh, but they they basically no no British ships could ban, could you could transport slaves that was way earlier like 1817 something like that I mean uh, anyway we we can well, I just have to interject it. being from Massachusetts and a big I I grew up not far from John and Abigail Adams home I, I, there was such and in Massachusetts generally there was a very strong anti-slavery sense even back then and Massachusetts was one of the first states against it. And we could have a longer conversation about the roots of the American Revolution, which I'd love to have because it's an amazing time of history. But it it was it was what they said it was about, which is to get rid of the yoke of being controlled by the British across the seas so that they could elect people and make their own decisions about how they would be governed, including taxation and, and everything else. So I just didn't want to let that sit there with the American Revolution was not about slavery, although obviously that was a key condition they had to grapple with. Because otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't have half the country going with them. Uh, th thanks for that, Eleanor. And I'm, I'm sorry for being so vehement on that. I just, that book really kind of lit me up too much. Um, no, but it's a, it's a critical point. And when the Constitution, apparently the first draft Jefferson had, had it against slavery, like it would not be allowed. They had to take it out. But there was a fight at the Constitutional Convention around the issue of slavery. There were anti-slavery people in the room led by John Adams who fought about it. They realized they didn't have the votes in the room and that there would be no new United States if they didn't give on the question of prohibiting slavery. But they agreed as a strategy they would build into the system of the United States a process by which what they laid out for governance could be changed and amended over time. And they expected that that would become what the country would do down the road. I don't think they ever expected it would take 100 years, but we did eventually get there and they put a system of change and amendment in there so that could be fought at a later time. Thanks, Eleanor. And I think we, let's, I'd love to have that conversation and dive deeper into the history yes. um, at a different call. Um, Mike, then Gil, please. And then we're nearing the end of our hour. I was going to say just a couple of quick points. Uh, th thank you, Eleanor, for saying what you said about Massachusetts. I lived there for six years and got to know a lot of the history. But the best American history book I've ever read is uh, it's actually three books by Daniel Brewston the former Librarian of Congress, and it's just called The Americans. And what's special about it is rather than doing a chronology or you know, looking at major trends, he breaks out the United States into states or regions and tells the different forces that were shaping the politics of Virginia, the politics of New York, the politics of Massachusetts. Highly recommend it, even though it's 35 years old. The other thing I just wanted to weigh in on that, and reinforce what Ken said about looking at the problems that led to the Constitution. One of the other best examples that I've seen is about gun control. The reason that they wanted to have a Second Amendment for a well-regulated militia was because there were these uprisings in Western Massachusetts and in, in uh, New York. Uh, one was over the it was the Whiskey Rebellion. And there was a need to, to have local uh, militias to back up the local government because George Washington couldn't uh, couldn't tell the the army to go march up to uh, some obscure corner of, uh, of New York. So it has nothing to do with what we are today, which is 
Uh, we need bazookas so we can shoot the tanks when, or the black helicopters when the government does something we don't like. That's a different problem. Thanks, Mike. Um, Yell, thank you for being patient. Yeah, I'm um, I'm patient and frustrated. I feel thrown off the conversation um, um, because mm -hmm. slavery is hot, clearly, and I've got a lot more to say about it. But uh, we were talking about democracy and governance, and Ken made some really important points. And Jerry, just a suggestion. I think you know, the what you raised was good. The level of detail about it was not necessary. That's where that's where it lost it for me. Sorry about that. Yeah. So just uh, something for us to think about. And if you should, we we have a lot of hot buttons in this conversation. It's challenging. Um, what I wanted to say to Ken, um, Ken's point. Yes, uh, uh, paying attention to what they the issues they were trying to deal with is very helpful. Related to that, uh, I'm not a fan of us trying to define democracy or anything else because the labels get us into trouble. Because no matter what definitions you do, the words have connotations for other people. Um, and we lose the focus of the conversation. The most vivid example of that these days is the pro-life, pro-choice bullshit, uh, which is a, a, a strategic reframing that had enormous, to my mind, damaging political impact. Um, but the main thing I had wanted to say briefly back then to Ken about consent of the governed. Um, the game depends on consent of the government. Uh, uh, consent that includes consent to the majority when it doesn't go my way. That's a difficult thing to do. And it's a thing that, you know, that 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 that, that certain folks are rejecting right now. Uh, but that has to be part of the democratic process because I won't always get my way. Uh, and how do you know? And how do I have enough trust uh, in the community and the shared values and the overall dynamics of things that I'm winning, winning to do that and win sometimes and lose sometimes and find common ground and come back together and do it again and again and again? Uh, and that's been lost in you know in, in part the MAGA game and part the Gingrich game. Um, I don't know how I don't know how that gets rebuilt except through you know, relationship and engagement and gradually rebuilding trust. Well, moving past a two-party system into a more parliamentary one where you have to build coalitions. Yeah, well, that doesn't feel like a near-term option in this country, Ken, so I don't know. Uh, are we working on near-term options or are we working on what does a good governance look like? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah both of those, yep. Another short-term thing. How come Biden keeps referring to Trump as my predecessor instead of as the sore loser? Because that's what Trump is. He's just a sore loser. He won't concede defeat. No, he's not just a sore loser. Well, he's way more than that. But but calling him a sore loser would yeah. would he would hate being called a loser. Yeah. He refuses to be. But so uh, that would get under his skin, I think, really pretty well. Somebody, <laughs> I forget who it was, was making the case that the, that the game should be just ridiculing him at every opportunity. Getting under his skin, calling him a loser is one way to do that. Yeah. Isn't that what got him into politics in the first place? Um, there's Barack Obama at the correspondence dinner, uh, ripping oh. him. It seemed oh, to, yes. to be the stupidest political move I've seen in my lifetime. Because he did, he thought about it before then, but that was the point where you said, oh, yeah, fuck you, I'm going in. I think. Yep. Yeah. I think I have that clip. If that clip is still alive, I'll share it in the... Uh, hold on a second. Copy. Somebody tell me if this clip still plays that dinner. Um, let's not spend time on that. Yeah, day. no. Uh, and we're we're past our time. And um, I I don't intend to go back in and keep doing these calls, but I'm interested in the topic. So uh, open to proposals or suggestions. Um, but it's probably time to wrap this call. And I had asked Ken if he would mind reading uh, Let America Be America again, even though I attributed it to the wrong person. It's a Langston Hughes poem, but um, that might be a nice way to wrap this series. Let America be America again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. 
Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land of liberty is crowned, excuse me, oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient chain of profit, power, grab, of grab the land and gain, of grab the gold, oh, grab the ways of satisfying need, of work, the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today, O oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. I am the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world, still a surf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, in every furrow turned that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I am the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I am the one who left dark Ireland shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee and torn from Black Africa strand where I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions of relief on relief today, the millions shot down while we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed, for all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where everyone is free, the land that's mine, the poorers, the Indians, the Negroes, me who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring our back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. For those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take our land back again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape, and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain all stretch out, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America, America again. We need red so hats with pictures of Langston Hughes on them. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. That was awesome, Ken. Thank you. Just realized I was muted. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, thank you all for being in the conversations. Um, that's a wrap for this one. But uh, I think there's a lot of stuff in our heads that uh, we'll find ways to share and express. So thank you. Thanks all.
Bob Matley, good to see you. <laughs> yeah. In a minute. More later. <laughs> and congrats, congrats on your new book. Oh, thanks. Read it. That's the good read. <laughs>